Shabbat Shalom. It's been a busy couple days. Amen. I'm not going to put any uh, John Mellencamp on this week, so I'm just going to warn you already, okay? And actually, Bon Jovi. Just kidding. Just kidding here, okay? This morning, I want to paraphrase some thoughts that are shared by another Messianic rabbi, Rabbi David Tokacher, from his book, Spirited Truth, as it relates to this week's parasha. The title of this morning's, of this Shabbat's drosh, is The Battle Rages On. What inspired the title, for those who read the portion, as I know some of you faithfully do, Linda, and there's others, but if you, if you read an entirety of our portion, you'll have noticed, you would have noticed that our portion of Scripture opens it closes, speaking of war, speaking of war. But in between these two stark realities, we find 74 mitzvot addressing a wide array of issues that B'nai Israel might face in their walk. Now keep in mind, most of what we find in Devarim is repetition from previous Torah drashas and discussions as a refresher before crossing the Yarden or Jordan. And this is the case with a lot of what we find in this week's parasha. Often God will reiterate what he's already said because we do such a fine job of remembering and applying those principles in our lives. That was deep sarcasm. I was laying that on really thick. As we process through, process through key tetsi, we see that the primary focus of this parasha is two-part. Vahavta l'orecha kamocha. Love your neighbor as yourself. And secondly, righteousness of the camp before our holy God. Love your neighbor and righteousness in the camp. Pretty much everything found in parasha key tetsi covers one of these two issues that are both independent yet in really many ways intertwined. So moving forward, I want you to think, take a moment and think about a time when you found yourself stuck between both righteousness and worldliness. And that's honest. And that's transparent. I'm sure we'd be surprised how often this actually does happen for all of us, or more so maybe how often we allow it, allow it to happen. But just consider how many, for a moment, just consider how many pastors and rabbis and evangelists who have led many, many, many people to salvation and faith in Yeshua. But in the midst of such fruitful ministry have fallen to horrendous sexual scandals. Even, even right here in our own community just a year ago. And most of you probably don't even know about it. I do. Very large church. Perhaps you found yourself trying to live a holy life on the outside. And yet on the inside, well, it's a different story. Maybe you haven't fully given everything over to the Lord in your walk. I want to read a portion of Scripture from this week's parsha, Devarim chapter 21, verses 18 to 21. Suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not listen to the voice of his father or mother. And they discipline him, but he does not listen to them. Then his father and mother are to grab hold of him, bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of his place, and they will say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious, 
He does not listen to our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Do you happen to notice that order? Did you happen to notice that? The priority that was given between being a drunk and being a glutton. Then all the men of his city are to stone him with stones to death. So you will purge the evil from your midst. I want you to hang on that. Purge the evil from your midst. And all Israel will hear and be afraid. Now, in context, it's important to remember what we read last Shabbat, if you read the portion completely, from Shoftim. And I'll refer back to Deuteronomy or Devarim 17, verses 6 to 7. By the word of two or three witnesses, the one who is to die is to be put to death. No one is to be put to death by the word of just one witness. The hand of the witnesses is to be first to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you are to purge the evil from your midst. Now I'm using the Chia Life version for that translation because I like how it renders. Where the complete Jewish Bible uh, would say, David Stern translates, sort of drive this wickedness from, your, from, from among you, is I think how he translates it. I like purging the evil from your midst. Now, and this is the case of the, of the wayward son, what I just read. This isn't a child, brothers and sisters. This is a grown man for whom the parents have determined there is no hope. As such, both parents have to bring him to the city gates and make the declaration against him. If the father is on board but the mother isn't, or vice versa, then the capital punishment can't be carried out. They are the two witnesses. As such, they must also cast the first stones. And as Endeavor 21 21 states, the purpose of this is to what? Again, to purge evil from the midst of the nation of Israel. Herein, brothers and sisters, this morning and for this week to come lies the key to understanding this week's parsha. We are being presented, as so often occurs in Scripture, a choice. A choice. Our actions can either lift up the community around us or our actions can tear it all down. One or the other. Lift up the community, or you can tear down the community by your choices and by your actions. So I want to read to you several scriptures in a row from this week's Parsha Kitesi to illustrate what I'm trying to say this morning hoping to communicate this morning. So as we just read from the wayward son, 2121 in Devarim, then all the men of his city are to stone him with stones to death. So you will purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel will hear and be afraid. Brothers and sisters, evil is not the sort of ethereal and tangible. How do we know evil? How do we identify evil? Where do we look to find evil? Is there evil under here? Is it evil back here somewhere? Where is evil? Where do we find it? How do we locate it? How do we hunt it down? Right here. That's where it is. That's where it is. In the heart of men and women. And it's manifested and choices and decisions. That's how we find evil. So immediately, following this instruction is a discussion of a man being hung on a tree. He must not be left hanging on the tree all night. So we read from verse 21 in chapter 21 to 22 and 23. Suppose a man is guilty of a sin with a death sentence, and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree. His body is not to remain all night on the tree. Instead, you must certainly bury him the same day. For anyone hanged is a curse of God. 
You must not defile your land that Adonai your God is giving you as an inheritance. And then we read, again, in chapter 22 of Devarim, that if a man takes a wife with the expectation that she is a virgin, and it's revealed on their wedding night that she hasn't been exactly truthful and was not a virgin after all, if the bride's father can't prove her virginity, well, then the scripture says she is to be put to death. And then we read, but if this thing is true, verses 20 and 21, that the signs of virginity were not found in the young lady, then they are to bring the young woman out to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city are to stone her with stones to death, because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel, to behave like a prostitute in her father's house. So you are to what? Purge the evil from your midst. Pretty harsh stuff this morning, isn't it? Then this is followed by verse 22. Suppose a man is found lying with a married woman. Then both of them are to die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you are to purge the evil from Israel. And then verses 23 to 24. Suppose there's a young woman who was a virgin engaged to a man, and another man finds her in the city and lies with her. Then you are to bring them both out to the gate of that city and stone them with stones to death. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the town, and the man because he humiliated his neighbor's wife. So you are to purge the evil from your midst. And then lastly, we read from verse 7 in chapter 24. If a man is caught kidnapping any of his brothers from B'nai Israel, whether he treats him like property or sells him, then that kidnapper must die. So you are to purge the evil from your midst. You're a pretty sharp bunch. So I think you're catching on. You're catching on to the theme that's running through this parasha. And that theme is what? So you are to purge the evil from your midst. And we also see very similar verbiage used throughout the Torah from Shemot or Exodus through Devarim or Deuteronomy. And beyond the Torah, we see the reality that an overwhelming problem that Israel failed at was separating holy from worldly. Holy from worldly. Think about that. Think about not, and we say world, again, it's not just out there. It could be inside the confines of places of worship. Don't be so quick to damn those outside the doors because you're going to find unholiness inside the doors of worship. When we read through Nevi'im or the prophets, we see a continual stream of accusation against Israel for replacing Hashem with what? With gods. <laughs> with gods made by their own hands that are not gods at all. It's their delusion, but they came up with these gods, the things they worship, which is especially heartbreaking to think of because how often in the Torah we are reminded that we are not to desire to be like the world around us. That should never be our desire, but rather to live as a light to the nations. Adonai is my light and my salvation. Who shall I be afraid? That's what we are to be. We're to be light. And when people see light, again, as I said earlier, we are naturally attracted to light. So if we are light, then people might be attracted to us and maybe attracted to our message. Right? It's not really difficult to figure that out. 
We've got a choice. There it is again, oh, choice. Our actions can either lift up the community around us or, again, it can tear it down. And listen, here's the thing. The idea of the separation of holy and unholy can be looked at from multiple directions. First, it is very simply a matter of living a life that is holy before the Lord while forsaking the ways of the world, the way of Yeshua or the way of the world. That's always that battle that rages on, is it not? Sure it is. It's raging in your flesh right now. Right now, that battle is going on. But along with that, far too many believers take this idea to mean that we are called to beat sinners over the head with Scripture and call out their sins, you sinner. While often at the same time, we're trying to hide or bury our own. You know, more so because of the hypocrisy that has often been seen inside the body of Messiah from the many non-believers outside the community of faith who are supposed to be, who we're supposed to be sharing the Besarot to vote, the good news, the gospel. Who want nothing to do with the Messiah. Just take a look at a lot of churches. Take a look at them. Take a look at the ones that are packed every, every Sunday and those that are not. And don't for a minute, don't for a minute buy the lie that somehow that pastor is more anointed or preaching more truth. Don't buy that for a minute. Some of the holiest men, godliest men I've ever met and women are in very small congregations. Don't buy the lie. They see the hypocrisy in the body. And who can blame them? Who can blame them? Seriously. How often are we guilty for saying one thing and living another? Especially with those who pridefully claim that they are Torah observant. Right? Do you all claim to be Torah observant? Is that why you're here on Shabbat? Torah observant? But then you miss Shabbats. And you miss Holy Day services. And there's a little questionable kosherish. A little bit of unkosher behavior behind closed doors. Are you Torah observant? Do you feel good because you're here on Saturday? Making a statement, making a witness that we're different. Are you really? Are you really different? To that end, this was the fact, one of Yeshua's greatest complaints against the leadership at the time, the Parashim, the Pharisees. And don't throw the baby out of the bathwater, because there's some godly Pharisees. And they knew who Yeshua was, and they put it on the line for Yeshua. I'm sick and tired of hearing pastors throwing out the door, out the window, every Pharisee. And that's just wrong, because it's not true. You can't you can't generalize and say there's a pharisaical spirit. But what about those who, who honored Yeshua, and believed in Yeshua, and followed Yeshua? What are you going to do with them? No. Matthew 23, verses 1 to 7. Then Yeshua addressed the crowds in his Talmudim, and the Torah teachers in the Parashim, he said, sit in the seat of Moshe. So whatever they tell you, says Yeshua, take care to do it. But don't do what they do because they talk but don't act. They tie heavy loads onto people's shoulders, but they won't lift a finger to help carry them. Everything they do is done to be seen by others, for they make their tefillim broad and their tzitziot long, and they love the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and they love being greeted deferentially in the marketplaces and being called a rabbi. Notice Yeshua in saying that doesn't cast aside the halakha 
or instructions of the Prashim or Pharisees, nor does he say to toss out the Torah altogether. Has anybody ever found that in Scripture? Where Yeshua said, hey, look, you know, I'm here now. Let's just uh, nix all this stuff right here. Did he say that? Did he say, did he just grab one of those Torah scrolls out of the ark there and throw it on the fire? We don't need this anymore. I'm here. It's all new with me. Let's get her going here. Start writing down everything I had to say. Does, did that, is that right? Because that's what's being taught. That's what's being taught in seminaries and Bible colleges and from pastors. No. He didn't say to throw out the Torah. What he says is not live like the Pershing to the degree that we become hypocrites, more worried about what people see in our lives than what we're all, than about the righteousness that should be in our hearts. So I want to put it all in perspective really quick. Let's turn back to the Torah parsha again, our portion for this morning. When you go out as an army camp against your enemies, you are to guard yourself from every evil thing. The text then continues on to describe a few, few select issues, which by no means is a complete list of issues that could make any camp unrighteous. But the key to this passage and to the parsha as a whole is this morning's portion from Parsha Kitetsi. And again, what I read from the scroll. For Adonai, your God, moves about in your camp to rescue you and to hand over your enemies to you. Therefore, your camp must be a holy place. Adonai should not see anything indecent among you, or he will turn away from you. He will turn away. Now, if you want to go the distance and say, well, he's not saying you, is he saying you could lose your salvation? Well, that's a whole other discussion. But the point is, the point is, he could still be in the room, but he can do this. And that's a sign. If somebody does that to you, that's a sign. That's a sign that you've offended. He doesn't want to witness any more of what you are doing. So he's turning his back and looking the other way. And considering context, what is a bit odd is the, just the one or two verses that precede our selection for today. The two verses that precede our selection today. The Lord specifically details that there should be a place outside the camp where you can go outside and then in verse 14, the Lord commands us that we are to have a shovel with our weapons so that when we need to go potty, we are to go outside and dig a hole, take care of business, and then cover it up. And then Moshe says to the people, for I now your God moves about your camp. He moves about your camp to rescue you and to hand over your enemies to you. Therefore, your camp must be a holy place, a clean place. Adonai should not see anything indecent among you, or he will turn away from you. Now, in a very literal sense, simply in context of the passage, if I were to paraphrase, <laughs> hold on, this, I would simply say God walks among you, and he doesn't want any part of your crap. <laughs> we may not be going to war against our enemies today, in the same sense that Israel is preparing for in Devarim, but as we all know, we are in the midst of a spiritual war. And if you doubt me, well, Rabbi Shaul made it clear in Ephesians how many times we read that scripture, for we are not struggling against human beings, but against the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers governing this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And the enemy wants nothing more than to get us all caught up in our crap because he knows good and well that God doesn't want to smell it or step in it. He also knows good and well that the more we look like the world, the less we look like Messiah and therefore become powerless, furthering the kingdom. We are called to be righteous. We are called to be holy 
We are called to be set apart. And if you want to sum it up in one word, it's different. You've got to look different. Different. You've got to think different. You've got to respond differently. You've got to believe differently. You've got to act differently. You've got to be different. We are bought by the blood of the Lamb to be a spotless bride for Messiah. And we've got a choice. We've got a choice. Our actions can either lift up the community around us or it can tear down the community around us. And this is a key thing to grasp because throughout this partial Kitetsi, God's people are commanded to purge the evil from our midst. When God allowed the Babylonians to destroy Yerushalayim and the temple and take Israel captive, it certainly wasn't because of their righteousness, was it? It was because his people were walking the ways of the nations around them. That was the issue. So often, brothers and sisters, oh my gosh, so often as believers, you know, Sometimes I'm just really tempted to be real cute with messages, you know? I just want to be cute. I want to come up with some of their hip ideas, hip ways of saying things. You know, so you leave here all feeling all giggly in the spirit. I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't. I just, because it's just like I sit there and go, really, dude, is that the best you got? There's a whole lot of scripture there that needs to be addressed. Is that all you got? How many altar calls are you going to do a day for the same people? So often as believers, we are guilty of the same. We think we can live our lives righteously on the outside, share the Besserot to vote, the gospel to others, tell them how they should change. You need, dude, you need to change your life. And how the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, can help you. Help you be victorious over your sins and your curses and your oppressions and your addictions. And yet on the inside, we're full of crap. Our lives often are no better than the world around us, and sadly, they know it. You haven't fooled anybody. When we talk about the Bible out of one side of our face, and then talk like the world out of the other side. The world is seeing it. Your neighbors are seeing it. Your friends are seeing it. The people you work with are seeing it. Your family is seeing it. You're not fooling anybody. I work with people like that. Oh, my God. I work in my part-time job with people like that. Oh, they will, they will quote Scripture, and they'll say, God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. And they're just about as holy and syrupy as spiritually as it can get, and in that same mood, they will go around and conduct their business deceptively, cheating customers and other salespeople. And I watch it, and it is everything that I can do. When believers come to synagogue on Saturday or church on Sunday, whatever it may be, completely hungover, and doing the walk. You know, I didn't know what the walk of shame was. I had no idea what that was until, my, until I was told by some of the women in my family, you've never heard the walk of shame? I've never heard that before. You know, well, we'll talk later. <laughs> You're in a good place. <clears throat> You're in a very good place if you don't know what that is. But you come hungover with the walk of shame from the night out at the clubs on Friday or Saturday night. The world sees it. The world knows it. We do, in fact, live in the world. Of course we do. We live in the world. We're just called not to be of the world. Right? And I want to, crap, I want to quote Rabbi Tokachur directly from his book, Spirit and Truth, where he says, we live in what I call, what he calls, but what he's quoting him. Rabbi Tokachur says, I, what I call a post-truth era a post-truth era. In other words, the world around us no longer believes in a finite truth. Yet the truth of the good news of Messiah Yeshua 
is indeed a finite truth. The problem, though, is that the world around us can see immediately through the charades we're trying to play. Says Rabbi, if our, word, if our lives don't match our words, it doesn't matter how hard or with how much conviction we preach the truth of the good news. If there is sin in our lives, they can see our lives are just as rotten as theirs. And if that's the case, then what are we really offering the world? What are we offering? So God's call of righteousness has not changed since he called Avraham out. The message is the same. We've been called to be righteous and holy, to be set apart from the world around us. We have been called to carry the light of Messiah into a lost, dark world. As such, we must live our lives, right, modeled after Messiah Yeshua. And to do that, we've got to forsake the ways of the world in order to win the world for the way of Messiah. And to this end, Rabbi Shaul says in his letter to Rome, a very important letter, considering its placement in all the apostolic writings offerings, it tells you it's extremely important. I exhort you, I exhort you, Therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourself as a sacrifice, living and set apart for God, this will please him. It is a logical temple worship for you. So in other words, he says, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the Olam Hase. Instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God wants. Know what God wants. And we'll agree that what he wants is good. And it's satisfying. And able to succeed. Have you asked that question lately? What do you want, God? Why don't you pray that sometime? Hi, God. What do you want? Because we're so busy telling him what we want. <laughs> right? Let's try. Hey, God. What do you want? Here I am. I'm, I'm listening. What do you want? Again, we've got a choice. Our actions can either lift up the community around us again or can tear it down. And again, for Rabbi Shaul in Ephesians, for this reason, I fall on my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth recedes its character. And I pray that from the treasures of his glory, he will empower you with inner strength by his spirit so that the Messiah may live in your hearts through your trusting. Also, I pray that you will be rooted and founded in love so that you with all God's people will be given strength to grasp the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of the Messiah's love. Yes, to know it, even though it is beyond all knowing so that you will be filled with all the fullness of God. Filled with the fullness of God. Is there room for God in your life? Or you, you put, you, have you sort of partitioned an area for God? You know, has he had to kind of find a place amongst all the other stuff? Or is it fully God? I want you to imagine a couple things this morning. Take a moment and imagine. Imagine how much more powerful our impact for the kingdom of Messiah would be if we put his way above our own. Can you imagine that? Imagine how much more powerful our impact on the world around us would be if we spent more time focused on his presence than focused on what's taking place in the world around us. And I'm not saying you hide like, like you know, like, like a monk, you know, Imagine we spent more time in the Word of God than we spend in the world of social media. Imagine if our hearts and lives looked as put together as we strive to make ourselves look in our Instagram posts. 
Imagine if our discipleship came before our desire for worldly possessions. Imagine, I imagine, imagine if we truly took to heart, truly took to heart Yeshua's words from the Sermon on the Mount. Whoa. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not store up for yourselves wealth here on earth where moths and rust destroy and burglars break in and steal it. Instead, store up for yourselves wealth in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and burglars do not break in or steal. For where your wealth is, there your heart will be also. Imagine. Imagine if we truly purge the evil from our midst. And I'm not talking about going on like some killing spree with an AR, but I mean literally allowing the Lord to purge the evil from the midst of our hearts. You can pick your choice. You can have a pistol. I don't care. But I'm not talking about that. And this is as much a call for the community as it is for the individual because sin in the life of one of the community can quickly infect the community as a whole. If one of you are, is an unrepentant sin, I trust me, your attitude, because it isn't so much about the sin, it's your attitude towards the sin. You know what I'm saying? It's, that's, that's the difference. There's all, everybody's got sin in their life. That's not the issue at play here. It's the attitude towards the sin. That's, that's, and that attitude can sort of like putting something like in the bathtub and it just kind of works it away or in the stream like an oil slick and you see it move around and it moves to one person to another. Your attitude infects. For I deny your God moves about in your camp to rescue you and to hand over your enemies to you. He's moving about your camp because he wants to hand over your enemies to you, to your control. Adonai should not see anything indecent among you or he will turn away from you. He doesn't want to, again, he doesn't want to look at it. So we've got a choice. Our actions can either lift up the community around us or, again, tear it down. So we're getting to be time for Onig, so I'll wrap this up. <laughs> I really mean it. A little, our guests, our newer times, there's a little bit of cynicism we're praying against right now. We're working on that. And in saying that, the question for you this morning is, what kind of crap is in your life? What kind of crap are you dealing with in your life that the Lord is smelling and is having to step over, that he's had to turn his back on because it's, he doesn't want to look at it, doesn't want to see it? Maybe you've been struggling with inappropriate relationships. Are you dating or looking with, for somebody that, where you're going to be equally yoked? As I've always said with relationships, is that individual drawing you near to the Lord or further from the Lord. If they're helping you draw near to the Lord, there's a catch. If you're compromising in that relationship, dump them immediately. Maybe you've been struggling with addiction issues. And I know what the big four are in addiction. We all think, oh, those are horrible addictions, drugs and, and drinking and gambling and porn. Oh, well, let me give you a couple other ones that maybe you never think about. How about video games? Well, that's not bad as drinking or drugs, right? What about video games? What about hoarding? What about hoarding? What about gambling? I bet a lot of people in here buying lottery tickets. That's gambling putting your faith in chance. Oh, and what about gluttony? You guys being good stewards of your body, you eating appropriately? You following kosher? Kosher has to do not only with what you eat, but how much or how little you eat. That includes even fasting. Maybe you've been struggling with anger. 
You may just made a lot of you angry right now. Maybe I'm poking the bear. Struggling with anger and aggression. Taking control. I want to be in control. That's what the garden was all about. Hava. Adam. That was control. That's what that was all about. They want to be the gods of their life. They want to be in control. Or maybe even struggling with gossip. Or Lashon Hurrah. Or maybe there's just a whole other pile of crap you've been trying to hide. Whatever it is, we're all full of crap in one way or another. And this season of Teshuvah is our opportunity to relieve ourselves of a lot of that crap and confront those issues and to repent fully and, and to surrender fully to the Lord. You remember, I want to remind you, as I said at the beginning of this drosh, this week's portion begins and ends with a battle, with war. And we are in an ongoing war between righteousness and worldliness. Messiah came to bring light into the world, and he was empowered, and has empowered us through his Ruach, his spirit, to carry that light into the darkness that is permeating our existence. I don't know about you, but as I watch everything happening all around us, just as there is less and less daylight as we inch closer to winter, so is our world growing darker and darker and darker. And how much more important is it that we forsake the way of the world in order to do, protect the way of Messiah of Yeshua? He promises us that darkness will not overpower the light. So if we are feeling consumed by the darkness, it is not because he isn't victorious. It's because we aren't walking in his victory. That victory we spoke about two Shabbats back and instead allowing the enemy to snuff out the light of Messiah in our lives. Teshuvah, brothers and sisters, and for the sake of our guests and visitors, we are in a 30-day cycle. It's a, it's, a, it's a rabbinical Jewish tradition that we've embraced, like the reading of Psalm 27. I thank you for Zakin Lindstrom for educating us on that psalm. That was good stuff. And we embrace another tradition, which is Teshuvah. It's basically a 30-day of preparation leading up to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Well, actually, to, I take that back. Leading up to Yom Teruah, the Day of the, the Awakening Blast or Shout. So we, it's a time called Teshuvah. Teshuvah in, in Hebrew literally means to turn or repent. So we are in this season of... Teshuvah, and this is our opportunity to change where things are headed, at least maybe in our lives. And the truth is, each and every day of our walk with the Lord, we've got to actively make a choice between walking to light, to live out our discipleship, to forsake the ways of the world, and to overcome temptation, no matter what that might be for us. Our walk with the Lord, as you know, is a relationship. And just like a marriage relationship, you have to choose every day. Sometimes you're feeling it, brothers and sisters, and sometimes you're not feeling it. Now, in the case of my wife, I can't ever imagine that because I'm so lovable. <laughs> but for the rest of us, <laughs> but it is a relationship in all seriousness. It is, and sometimes you're just not feeling it, and you got to choose up. You got to choose when you wake up in the morning and say, "I'm going to love that person, even." And sometimes I'm just not feeling it. I'm going to love that woman, that man that I'm blessed with. I want to encourage you to evaluate your own heart and life. And many of us already know the areas of our lives that are obviously crappy, right? We know what they are, but there may be other areas that we simply have shoved so far down we don't realize the root issues that are still there. Ask the Lord during this time of Teshuvah to draw to your attention any and all areas of crap that are stinking up your relationship with him and others, stuff we have yet to deal with, stuff that has simply been holding us back from our potential for the kingdom. And as the Lord begins to illuminate those areas, let's utilize these days of Teshuvah, reading, reading ourselves for the approaching Holy Day season, repenting and allowing Hashem to restore us and renew us completely. And when the holy days have passed and the battle for our soul, as you know, will continue to rage on. I'm just telling you not negatively, but proactively. 
Once we get through these high holy days, as every high holy day cycle, don't think that the battle is done. The battle will continue to rage on. You're just better equipped to deal with it. You're better equipped to deal with it. So let us continue beyond the season of Teshuvah to daily practice this introspection and repentance in our discipleship so that we may learn to walk humbly and victoriously in the way of Messiah. Do you want that? Then rise. <clears throat> Father, as we bow our heads, we do so in humility. And as we are looking down, Father, I guess we can imagine that there might be some of our crap on the floor there. It might be because there's a lot that we need to purge ourselves of. And so I pray, Father, that we will do our best during the season to shuva, to clean up our act, and to, and to acknowledge the fact that you don't really want to see that in our lives. You want to see us walking in holiness and purity. You want the house to be clean. You don't want us to infect others with the disease of our uncleanness. And we're making that choice today, Father. We're making that choice during the season to shuva, Father, to, to ask for your Holy Spirit to cleanse us and ready us for the days to come and to equip us with all that we need to not constantly be struggling with the battle that will rage on, but to be better equipped to do battle and to not shoot ourselves in the foot with our disobedience and our rebellion and our lack of uh, lack of cleanliness, if you may. So, Father, thank you. Help us to wash our hands of these areas of sin in our lives so that we can be a holy, set-apart, righteous witness and our hypocrisy will be no longer so that our witness will be powerful for the kingdom and fruitful. The Shem Yeshua Adonai, the congregation says... Iverich Yahweh, Vaish Marecha, Sadonai, Parabalecha Vichanecha, Sadonai, Parabalecha, Simlecha, Shalom. The Lord bless you. And keep you, the Lord, make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord to lift his countenance upon you and that he would grant you his shalom, his peace. B'Shem Yeshua Adonai, and the congregation says, Hine go aleinu chai, behold. Behold our righteousness. <laughs>